You know, any competent mechanic can tear an engine down, replace parts inside of it with replacement parts, and then reassemble it, fresh bearings, gaskets, whatever it happens to be, in the course of a day. It's not that big of a deal. That's assembling an engine, meaning that it was already together once. All of these parts knew each other, and now you're going to put it all back together again. But building an engine, on the other hand, is a completely different process. And in this case, you're either using aftermarket parts, adding aftermarket parts, or building from scratch uh, with factory components, or putting together like what we're doing with this 3D3, where we're using components that were never meant to work together, but we're going to put them together anyway to net a result that we're looking for. So the example of this, using this 3D3, is that we're using 1969 pistons that have a positive deck height with 1967 cylinder heads that have a closed chamber, which means that the only distance between the top of the piston and the combustion chamber is going to be the thickness of the head gasket. So to know exactly where each of these pistons lie in the engine is crucial to picking the right gasket and get us the result that we're looking for. So here's where things get a little crazy and why it's building an engine and, and we're going we're to get into a lot of the processes that we go through later on, but I'm going to give you an example. So let's look at this piston and this piston. So these two pistons came out of the same engine. It's a 1969 3D3 HP motor, Roadrunner engine. By the book, they're supposed to have a 12,000th positive deck height. But now when we measure them, we find that this one is 14 thousandths out of the hole, meaning positive deck, and this one is minus four thousandths. All right, so now think about that for a second. Same pistons, same engine, off the same assembly line, and one of them is 14 above and one of them is four below. These were checked on one cylinder. So this way there's no variation differences in deck height, so everything was checked on the number one cylinder, so we had a control, right? Each of the pistons was, were installed in this cylinder, run to top dead center, and then the measurement's taken. And this is what we get. 14 thousandths positive, minus 4 thousandths on this one. A difference of 18 thousandths of an inch from the same engine. Now, if we were just assembling this, or we're reassembling it, or we're putting it together with the parts uh, that it originally came with, it, it wouldn't make a difference. You tear any factory assembly line engine apart, and that's what you're going to find. Differences, um, production clearances are always loose or always sloppy because these things aren't being carefully hand assembled like McLaren engines. They're assembly line motors. And there's a batch of pistons and rods come and they, just, they slam it together and they send it down the road. And those clearances don't really matter. But now you're building a high performance engine, you're looking to get the most out of it. Or, like we're doing, you're mixing and matching components and these measurements become very critical. That's where it becomes an issue. So, to go one step further on this process, which is loosely known as blueprinting, there's, there is there is no like like textbook definition of what blueprinting an engine is. But for the most part, it's checking, measuring, making any type of corrective measures necessary to get an engine to within the specification that either the manufacturer calls for or the specification that you're calling for because you're modifying or you're building this thing. So along those lines, we checked all eight of our piston and rod assemblies on this hole, this one hole. And we found that a few of them were this, measured the same and a few of them were high and a few of them were low. Then what we did was we took one control piston and we measured it here. We took, put the piston in here, ran top dead center, made, took our measurement, and we found that there's a 5,007 inch difference in deck height from front to the back. So we made a mark here, 5,000s. Then we did the same thing on this side. We took our control piston, measured it here, and as it turns out, this is the same as this. But when you come to the back of the motor, this one is 4,000s lower. So, what did we do now? We selected our pistons, we hand selected our pistons, so that the differences in height of the piston make up for the differences in height in the deck. And we'll have a much more even engine as far as compression heights go. You could square the block. 
but there really isn't enough of a difference. And four or five thousandths on the deck, that's actually, that's actually less than typical that you'll find on an assembly line motor. So this is good to go. But the blueprinting process, this whole bit of pre-assembling, pre-measuring, and hand-fitting components is extremely time-consuming. It's very tedious because you're going through the same procedure over and over and over again. But to gain maximum results, stuff that will either live or give you the most power, it's absolutely necessary. Then this example I'm giving you with the, with the pistons and rods on this engine, guys who race like, for instance, stock laminator or any form of racing where you're limited to using the stock or factory components, they'll give you a certain part number that you have to use this part number. If they're building this 3D3, they will go around and get as many of those pistons as they possibly can. And they'll find the ones that all have the highest compression height. It's the same thing with rockers. Stock elevator guys will have, let's say if you're racing big block Mopars, you will have literally hundreds of these rockers around because they're all going to be just slightly different. And one of them is going to give you just another, an extra 5,000 slift or whatever it happens to be. Because manufacturing toler tolerances mean that this dimple and this dimple are not necessarily in exactly the same place. And now, if I'm going to assemble this motor for stock eliminator type use, I'm going to go through all of these rockers. It'll take me days. I'll go through all of these rockers and check each one and find the ones that give me the greatest ratio. That's nitpicking, but that's how those guys take things like 273 two-barrel engines and put them in 4,000-pound coronet station wagons and run in the 13s with them. That's how it's done. It's that careful hand-picking and selecting of each individual component to give maximum advantage. So that mock-up process is, is key to it and best practices to get it done. And this, again, it doesn't necessarily have to do with just stock components, even if you're building aftermarket stuff. Well, let's say you're building a stroker. Um, the pre-assembly and the measurement of everything is absolutely crucial. And to do that, you want to start with the block basically in this condition. This has been completely degacked. The machine work that we're going to have done to the block is already done. So everything is clean, there's no grease, there's no oil, and we can assemble, but most importantly, we can make modifications. And if we have to do a little grinding on something, if we have to do some filing on something, if we have to drill on something, whatever it happens to be, we don't have an oily, dirty surface for those shavings to, to stick to. We have a clean surface. So essentially, when we're done with this process of, of mocking it all together, you want to be able to just wash this block with soap and water, dry it off good, and then assemble it. So that's important. And like I said, you're dealing with, let's say, a stroker motor, which is so common. People love to build stroker motors. And I don't want to get specific to Mopars, because this really applies across the board to anything. But let's say you're building a stroker motor, you know, as you're going to make, want to make your measurements spinning the motor and making sure that the bottom of the cylinder bores, the connecting rod is going to clear on all sides at the bottom of the cylinder bores. More often than not, you'll have to make a modification. Same thing if you're going from a, a factory connecting rod to an aftermarket connecting rod. Sometimes things inside of an engine are so close that you make that little change and you're going to have to dig yourself a, 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 you know, a, a relief at the bottom of the cylinder bore. Oil pickups, you know, on the, like for instance on these Mopars, uh, they don't, the big block Mopars, they don't have the oil pump back here, it's just hanging completely out of the way. The pickup tube has to run through the gamut before it. So if you make changes or you use a different style pickup, you may not, it may not have the clearance. Actually, I just had that recently with an engine I put together, a Slant 6, where I modified the oil pickup tube, but it came so close to a connecting rod that the rod actually dug a little trough in the pickup tube. So you measured, I measured it, but I thought I had enough clearance, but I didn't. It was just enough distortion when the engine was running for the rod to nick it, right? So you have to pay attention to every little detail as you go along. So this blueprinting process applies to the entire engine, the whole assembly. And I'll give you like another example. So from the factory, they put these dowel pins in the deck to locate the cylinder head. And conversely, they have the matching holes in the cylinder heads. So now when, when you put this together, the dowels are supposed to center the combustion chambers over the bores. 
but it doesn't always work out that way. So at this point, what we want to do after we've done our pistons and measurements and all of that, we'd want to drop the crank out of it, bolt these heads on. This is something I'll do sometime either today or tomorrow. We'll bolt a cylinder head on each side and check to make sure that the dowels register the combustion chambers directly over the cylinders. And we may find that one head works best on one side and the other head works best on the other side. We won't know until we do that. Or sometimes you'll use an offset dowel to put the cylinder head where it has to be. And here's another example. These chambers aren't always exactly perfect. As cast, or I should say as machined, sometimes they're a little off here, they're, they'll hang over a little bit. You would put the cylinder head on the deck, on the block rather, and then from underneath see what parts of this combustion chamber may overhang the cylinder. At that point you would want to dress these down so that you don't have any sharp edges inside the chamber that can lead to hot spots and detonation. It's little things like that that make a huge difference in the, not only the performance but the longevity of the engine. You know, if you create, you've got a sharp edge of the combustion chamber or a sharp edge of the cylinder head overhanging the chamber, it becomes a glow plug. You know, it can become a glow plug. Tear your stuff apart. For what, right? So, and then of course, you're talking about camshafts. Now, you're gonna put a cam, you're gonna, you're gonna put a higher lift cam than stock in an engine. You have to worry about valve to piston clearance, which is something that you would measure during this blueprinting process. But you also have to look at the valve guides. Do the valve guides need to be trimmed down to, to allow the extra lift of the camshaft to push the valve all the way in without the retainer hitting the top of the guide? So, and uh, these things, I just generally automatically take these down a little bit, just for clear, you know, for, for uh, because even though the cam I'm putting in here now, let's say this is good to 550 lift, and I'm only putting a 528 lift cam in here, um, if I want to go to, let's say, a 570, 580 lift cam, I would have to tear this whole thing apart. So ahead of time, I know that I'll be messing around with this engine, so ahead of time, I'll take these down just to make sure there's that extra clearance. But these are all part, that's all part of the blueprinting process. And it is repetitive, and it takes time. You know, like for instance, last night, I spent probably a good five hours measuring the pistons and, and double checking things. Okay, well, I'm not sure about this. Let me check that, blah, blah, blah. It takes time. It's very tedious, very time consuming. And by the time we're done fitting this whole engine together, mocking it all together and checking everything, you're talking about probably a week's worth of like, you know, not full time work, obviously. You're not like for, you know, for a solid week, but it'll take a week of a few hours a day or a few hours a night of going through all of this and, and, and that's before you actually assemble it because after you've done all of this mock-up work, after you've measured everything and clearanced everything and done everything else, now it all has to be taken apart, it all has to be cleaned, and then it all has to be put together for the final assembly. So that's the difference between assembling an engine and building an engine. And, and I gotta say right here at this point, I am not an engine builder. Right? I'm a careful engine assembler. There are guys out there who are builders. I, I bow to them. They have incredible skill, incredible talent. But I know enough of the process to get me by and get maximum results from what I'm working with. And I hope that that's what you end up, you pick up something like that from these videos. So that's it. Back to measuring and grinding and stuff. I'll see you tomorrow.